Okay, and a very, very, the warmest of welcomes to Jasmine Alec, our guest today. So Jasmine has been voted um, number one copywriter and number one personal brand on the whole of LinkedIn, which is just incredible. He's a Fortune 500 copywriter and probably one of the most prominent voices on LinkedIn as well. So very warm welcome to you today, Jasmine. Thank you so much for your time. Most welcome. Good. Mo- do we say good morning or do we just say hello? Uh, hello. We don't we tie it. Hello. Yeah. It's, it's morning for us at okay. the moment. <laughs> okay. Well, hello. Thank you for the invite, Heather. It's my pleasure to be here, and thank you for the very filled up intro. I yeah. don't know if half of this. I don't know if half of the stuff is correct, but thank you. <laughs> Works <Yeah>. for me. <laughs> Works for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you two sets of questions. There's two two topics I'd love to speak about today. So first one being copywriting, and second one being LinkedIn. Um, so I'm going to get straight into it. I know that your time is very precious. So if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into copywriting in the first place, please. How I got into copywriting is actually a very funny story. It was by accident. Okay. I was uh, so back in 2010 when I was still at university. I would just write articles online or even in person, people would just hire me to write stuff for them. Back then I was just charging chump change, just trying to get some you know, pocket money. But around 2015 or 16, I registered on Upwork and I was just still doing articles. Like I wasn't doing any copy, any website copy, ads or whatever, I had never done that. So as I'm scrolling through these job searches, I keep seeing this word copywriting or website copy or this copy and that, I'm like, what the hell is this? Because at that point, I had no idea, like yeah. just legitimately, I had no idea. And I was like, wait, let me just click on one of these job posts and let me see. Maybe it is something for me because I already know how to write. Like, how hard is it to go from articles to this? And then I see it's like all the stuff I had been doing for myself for years prior to this, because people might not notice, but I used to be a rapper. I used to have this big, long music musical career, five years and 200 songs, six albums, MTV, X Factor, all that. Wow, I was wow. like really into music. But during those years, I did all of my branding, all of my PR, all of my communications, every single thing that went online and offline, I did it myself, for myself. So when I saw those job ads and it said, you know, write a website, write a Facebook post, write an ad, I was like, I already know how to do this. I just didn't know that's what it was called. So yes. that's how I got into copy and the copywriting Amazing. So pretty funny it was by accident yeah i think i hear a lot of that a lot of big copywriters saying actually i didn't really know what it was i was already doing it i didn't know what the term copywriting meant it's the same for me actually i had to look it up somebody said do you want to do some copywriting and i had to type type into google oh yeah i know how to do that that's fine <laughs> yeah exactly because um, it is what it is just being honest you know yeah exactly um so you've been ranked number one copywriter and number one personal brand um on linkedin which is amazing so what do you think and there's a big question what do you think differentiates you from other copywriters well first of all by the way i don't know if the second part is true i know it's around linkedin growth i don't know about personal brand just so we're clear that's what i know just so we're clear (laughs) so people don't come at me in the comments i think it's just a different approach to sharing tips like Mm -hmm. i try not to become like a tip hub if that makes sense yeah i see a lot of accounts i guess overusing one strategy Mm -hmm. of sharing their content and it just becomes very very predictable in the sense of okay i'm gonna get this today i'm gonna get the same thing tomorrow i'm gonna get get the same thing the day after you're basically a tip hub that's Mm -hmm. all you're sharing that's all you're doing i never wanted to become that just because I wanted people to like keep their attention all the time. It's not just like I'm getting their attention with one post and then two, three, four, whatever days or weeks after I've lost their interest just because I've just kept on banging on the same door and it was literally the same exact content, just slightly different tips. Like how many tips can you actually share? Like that was my question. So I never wanted to do that. I think what differentiated the content was just an always unique approach to every post and to how I share the tips. Like for example, you've heard the you've heard the tip like in writing and on LinkedIn in general, like write to one person. Don't write to millions, write yeah. to one. Yeah. And I've heard it mil- millions of times. I've taught it, coached it, you know, like it's just something that does exist. But I was like, okay, I want to share this, but <clears throat> is it really new? Is it unique? 
Mm-hmm. So what I've done is I've shared my own version of it, which is called Dear Son, Love yeah. Dad. I love that. And yeah. this is legitimately how I write, but it's just that personal twist yeah. to a thing that already exists that kind of makes people go, oh, I never thought of it that way. Oh, Or, oh my God, that's so cool. Or, oh my God, you literally just explained it in a, in a totally new way to me, in a way yeah. that I've never looked at it before. So I think yeah. an approach like that, where you put your own spin on things, even though it's existing things, things that are not necessarily new, I think that's what people to resonate with you, to kind of become a fan of your thinking, not just necessarily a fan of your content which is what I really think is the true strength of any brand. Like people really follow you to hear from you, right? And not just necessarily follow you because they know they can find something right there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think, yeah, a lot of people speak in theory, don't they? They say, write write as you speak, write conversationally. And it's nobody really ever says how. And I love that sort of, that practical application that you've given with the dear son, love dad. It's always in my head as well. And it's something that's really mem- memorable. Um, and your, yeah, your, your content is not predictable at all. And when I, when I work through, there's a lot of people that have that formula and it's always, you know, it's a reliable thing. You know, you're going to get good value, but it does get, get boring quickly. Whereas you, you twist it up every time. There's something very personal and there's something very practical and yeah, it's really useful. Huge fan of your content. Um, well, thank you. So, <laughs> Well, actually, I, I mentor um, young female copywriters now, actually, it's something I've just started to do. And I'd love to share some of your wisdom with them. So what advice would you give to somebody completely brand new? They've, they've just worked out what copywriting actually is. <laughs> They're probably a talented writer anyway. What advice would you give to them just starting out right now, fresh um, into the okay. industry? That's easy for me to answer because I actually teach copywriting at the university. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I and a lot of my students like they don't know anything about copywriting, what it is, what it was, how to do it, how to approach it. What's even the first thing about it? And typically what we study in my lessons is two things. We study the human psychology mm-hmm. and we study the topic of attention. Like yeah. we probably spend a good two or three weeks around the topic of attention. And it's a super huge topic in marketing in general, not just copywriting because When you think about it, every single one of us, doesn't matter if we're direct competitors or just people out there running businesses and posting stuff online, we're all fighting for attention. Doesn't matter if you go into Times Square and there's millions of ads around you. Every single one of those is in it for themselves. So in particular moment in time, which is every single second of every single day, and I'll explain that in a bit. Everyone's fighting everyone. Apple is now not just fighting Samsung, Huawei, and all these companies because they're their direct competitors, but they're fighting everyone else. If you're at Times Square, all you want as an Apple owner, as an Apple marketer, like people like people working inside of Apple headquarters, all you want is people to look at you and your ad and to buy your product. Nobody else is. Nobody else is. On LinkedIn, on, in the online world, it's the same exact thing. You've got one feed, everyone's posts are in the same place. It could be dating advice, AI, copywriting, graphic design in terms of topicality, but you don't care about any of that. All you care about is getting that attention, those eyeballs onto your posts. I feel like this is a huge topic that doesn't get talked about enough. People talk about, hey, you need to do better than your competitor. You need to do better in your market. No, you need to do better, period. Like people, like in general, marketers, I feel like put too much attention on to how competition does things, mm-hmm. which yeah. is, uh, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But the bigger issue is we just need to worry about people's attention in general, because there are so many examples around us that we focus too much on the competition and how they do things versus how we should just treat people, how we should just talk to people. There's a good example of the, I don't know if it's called the, the good egg company or something. It's in the UK, like they're, they're literally manufacturers of eggs. Like they sell yeah, eggs. Oh, egg. Happy egg. Happy egg. Yeah. There you go. Happy egg. There you go. But the thing is, like I saw an ad from them that um, like, it was actually a packaging of one of their eggs. I don't know if it was like a six pack or something. And it said, you know, eggs rich in vitamin C. Let's just use vitamin C. I don't know if it's correct, but the thing is, why would they say eggs rich in vitamin C? All eggs are rich in vitamin C. Like literally every single egg on the planet, they're rich in vitamin C. 
So why would they say that? Because the competition isn't. Mm. Everyone's so focused on finding that super unique thing to beat the next person where it's like, just say the most obvious thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like bigger, better, flashier camera on iPhones and Samsung. Like they're always battling. All I need to hear as a customer is pixel perfect camera in daylight and at, at, in, like during the day and night. That's all I want to know. I just yeah. want to be certain, like completely confident in my camera's ability to take the photo. I don't even care how many megapixels it has. I don't even care what the sensor is. Yeah. So attention is really something that has a lot to do with human psychology because your attention gets caught with the things that you need the most. The truth mm-hmm. is you never need the flashiest item. You yeah. need the most useful thing. That's what you need. That's what every single one of us needs. On LinkedIn, it doesn't matter if it's information, doesn't matter if it's a service, doesn't matter if it's a product. You don't need the flashiest thing. You need the most useful thing to you in this particular moment in time. Yeah. That's what I mean by the combination of attention and human psychology. You need to understand how humans think. And this is one of those things. We just yeah. need stuff to work, period. Yeah. And that's it. Like, I don't want, I don't necessarily need my car unless I'm really suffering and I belong to that 1% of hypercar owners, not supercar, hypercar. Yeah. I don't need it to go zero to 60 in two seconds. I need it to be fast. Yeah. Period. I don't need it to go, I don't need it to like be, be super durable, like 2000 miles whenever I'm filling up a full gas tank. I need it to go 600, 700 miles. That's good for me because I'll never have a trip, you know, without a break that's longer than 600 to 700 miles. Like, I'll probably just stop at a gas station anyhow. Things like that. So just understanding human attention and how we think, I believe, is the key to good copywriting. And, yeah, yeah there's, there's just so many examples out there that are just pure simplicity. Yeah. It's like dead simple how to sell. But as humans and as marketers, we sometimes overcomplicate it. Like we just yeah. try to make it a science. It you know, it's just psychology. I think yeah, and that understanding your you really, really need to understand who you're speaking to to understand what they need. I think that's that's a really a lot of, that's another thing that people uh, talk about a lot. Understand your audience, but they don't explain how to do that. So if you can understand their pains and their problems and those things that they do want to fix on a very basic level, you know, those needs, then you can write around those. You can attract the attention with that as well. I think, that's, yeah, I think pain is a really good place to start when it comes to copywriting as well. Okay, Absolutely. brilliant. I'm just going to move my mouse here. We'll edit this bit out. <laughs> um, so I'm absolutely obsessed with AI. I think it's a really, really incredible um, transition that we're going through at the moment. Everything is transforming. All the products we know are transforming too. I think there's so much opportunity. So we seem to be split into two camps. Uh, One camp is going, oh, it's rubbish. It's generic. It's crap. It's going to dilute the quality of everything. The other camp are going, no, you're not doing, if you, if you think that's what's happening, you're not using it correctly. What, what, what's your opinion on the role of AI sort of as a copywriter in the next sort of few years? What do you think is going to happen? Well, in terms of AI, I'm not in either camp in the camp that, oh, my God, it's the greatest thing ever. And in the camp, it's complete rubbish. I'm actually mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle. I'm very aware of its capabilities, but I'm also very, like, realistically speaking, I'm very objective about what it can do. When it comes to writing in particular, I'm not impressed. I've said this at a, on a million occasions. I'm not impressed yet because I'm a very hard person to please. I write for a living. Yeah. Like that's literally what I do. And I'm very hard to please when it comes to writing, especially for a specific purpose, which is copywriting. So AI for me is a legit useful tool when it comes to research, ideation, giving me that initial draft. Or even if you're like a, like a blog writer, article writer, like giving you that initial structure, like just so you don't have to do the grunt work. Yeah. But bringing anything home or using anything from AI, produced by AI, and saying this is good enough to use, as far as writing goes, I still haven't seen it. As far as everything else, AI related, design, programming, like all these different skills that it can, like all these different things that it can do for us, I'm bloody amazed. Like I use yeah. AI on a daily basis, certain things like for meetings, there's assembly, like it literally does everything for you. I don't know if you're using assembly, but yeah, there's amazing tools out there for different purposes. But for writing, I'm actually rooting for it to work because A, it would free up so much of my time and B, it would open up new avenues for revenue for me. Yeah. Like I could legit, legitimately make more money by using AI because it would free up 
time and space for me and other processes that I have at the moment, AI would just enable me to generate more business. But at the moment, at this moment in time, as far as writing specifically goes, only for ideation, only for research. That's what it's exquisitely good for. Anything else for me, at least, still not there. Not even close. Yes, I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second half. So um, LinkedIn, and I'll speed up a little bit here because I think, uh, yeah, I've got too many questions. I wanted to cram so much in so much time with you. Um, So you've grown a huge brand on LinkedIn in just two years. um, And you've got nearly 100,000 followers. I've been on it nine years. I've got 20,000 followers. How, you know, um, you've got consistent virality for almost every post you put out there. So did you start off with a clear strategy? Did you arrive and go, right, I'm ready. I've, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Or is it something that you worked out along the way? My LinkedIn strategy has literally been ad hoc from day one. Uh. I, had n- I had no idea where I was going. All I knew is I had stuff to share. That's mm. all I knew. I already had experience. I was already a, you know, a, a business owner. I've already had a pretty functioning business even before LinkedIn. Like, yeah. A team of nine, even before LinkedIn, we're good. I didn't need LinkedIn in my strategy, in my business strategy. But when I did, and when I finally got onto it, I was like, I have so many things to share. I know like a lot of the things I have to share is 10 times better than a lot of the stuff I'm seeing in my timeline at the moment. I know I always say it's kind of selfish to think that way, but I just knew. I was like, why is all of this other content popping up where I'm like, I could do it better. Like, it's not even about the quality. It's not even about the virality of it. It's just about letting people in on a different world of information. Mm-hmm. That's that's all I wanted to care about at the moment. I did not care about followers. I did not care about monetizing LinkedIn even at that point. I was just like, I want to validate my ideas and all these experiences that I have, that I've accumulated over the years. I just wanted people to listen. That's all I wanted to do. Because at that point, imagine being like, at that point I was like in business for 10 years already, but I had zero social presence just because I hated social media. I like, I did it for my clients and everyone else. But for me personally, I just did not have the time or the nerve to just spend an hour, two, three daily on LinkedIn, just as an example. And over time, like as people started catching on, as people did validate my thinking and as people did confirm my initial, you know, thinking that this is something valuable, I was like, okay, let me do more of it. Let me figure out what works. And then I was basically just like a mad scientist analyzing (laughs) every post that has worked and analyzing every post that hasn't. Mm. Um, I was analyzing all of it. I was doubling down on the stuff that did work. I was trying out new things, new formats, new topics, uh, length, you know, formats, whatever. Like a, a lot of the stuff I've been doing is, has just been a result of ex- experimentation. Honestly, yeah. like I didn't see this working and I went like, okay, let me copy that, you know, and yeah. let me just apply it to myself. I was literally just experimenting what worked for me and my yeah. audience at that point in time. And over time, I just doubled down on the things that did work. Um, And yeah, right now, I guess you kind of become recognizable for a certain style, for for certain topics, for the way you deliver information. And I think I wish more people would not depend on like how everybody else is doing. I wish more people would experiment what works for them. I see a lot of it today, but not nearly as enough as I would like love it to to be on LinkedIn, like more originality is definitely something we still need. A hundred percent, definitely. I think, yeah, a a point you made about everybody has their own audience. We're all selling different things to different people. So when people go, oh, here is exactly how you do it. I think, well, it's not how it works for me. So my best converting posts have maybe, you know, 10 comments, my viral posts don't, don't So I'm, you know, I'm selling a high ticket product to a niche audience. There's never going to be this huge response to that because it's so niche. Yet that's what actually works. And it's sort of how how do you consider what do you consider to be a successful post? Is it one that actually gets money in the bank or is it one that gets you the sort of vanity metrics? And I suppose it has to be a little bit of both, doesn't it? Because you've got, you've got to grow your brand, grow your grow your kind of reach as well as as, as growing your revenue, too. So, OK, brilliant. So, um People new to LinkedIn tend to understand that you need a comment, a content strategy. So they know you need to post, but you are king of the comment strategy. Um, and that is something whenever I think of comments, I think of you um, with your super high value comments. So um, 
how did you work out that comments equal growth? And is there any kind of structure that you use when it comes to creating value in your comments? So on LinkedIn, comments to me were the the greatest thing I've ever discovered. Yeah. Just be, just because it allowed me to get in front of my audience multiple times per day. Yeah. See what a lot of people like don't realize like this is just the truth we don't realize that just by posting Mm -hmm. you're getting out in front of your audience once and that's it like ideally if you're posting seven days a week or five days a week that's only five or seven times they're going to see your face this week which is not enough if you want to stay top of mind if you want to you know be in these conversations but if you're commenting enough and as a bonus if your comments do get enough attention now people will start to see you everywhere people will start to see you in different places but if you're very strategic about it and and in the way you comment and the way you share your opinions and the way you deliver information what's going to happen is 24 7 whenever people see you they will see another piece of your mind Mm. if you're sharing tips that you would otherwise share in your posts but you're sharing them inside comments on other people's places what happens is your voice doesn't become redundant. Like it doesn't become an echo chamber just because you're in different places now. You're surrounded by different content from other people, different colors, different styles, mm. but you're still there and your voice is more or less always on brand. Yeah. So what I figured out as far as you know, strategic commenting on LinkedIn goes is whenever I go and leave a comment, I'm not just responding to a post. Mm. I am providing something additional to that post inside the comments so that when people read a particular post and they see me down there, they're more likely to react to both, to both the post and the comment. I think of it as like the comment, like take movies for an example. A bad comment is like a movie review. It's just something you have to additionally look for. It's just something that's unrelated. But a good comment is like a post credit scene. It's directly related to the to the post and it's right there below the post. And it just gives you that additional thing. You're still in the element like of that post. So for me, that was always the case. I was always of the mind state that I don't just want to react to this post and say, thank you, Heather. This was awesome. I love number seven. That's only useful for you. Yeah. Like you, the author of the post. But if I were to say something like number seven is so underrated, if more people did X, Y, Z, I feel like marketers could increase this and that. That would be a good comment in itself. People would react to it just because you're providing something that people can agree with. But if you were to go even a step further, you could say, here are three ways I do it. Like make your comment longer and then just provide three additional ways now your comment looks like a post, like a mini post. And people are like, damn, this guy's actually providing tips outside of his post. We got to watch what he's doing. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this is what I mean by strategic commenting, legitimately sharing stuff freely in every single thing you write. So now comments become content. Yeah. Everything you write, every single time you appear in that feed of your audience they will find something valuable. It's not just, hey, great post, hey, congratulations, hey, thank you for this. It's actually a piece of your mind every single time. Doesn't matter how long the comment is, how detailed it is, every single time, what you want to want to do is give them a piece of your mind. In return, what you're getting is staying top of mind for people. For new people, you're getting, they're getting on your profile and they're following you, so you're getting new followers. But as a whole, you're getting more brand authority or brand credibility. Excellent. Excellent. And I feel like just going off and commenting. How do you do it? So I found one of the biggest stumbling blocks for for this um, is it's scrolling through and finding people to comment on. Uh, Do you have a kind of system or a framework that you use? I saw a 11550 um, thing in one of your one of your comments, actually, ironically. Um, But yeah, uh, do you have how do you work out who you're going to do? Are you following just commenting on just the big creators or the small ones or prospects? Like, how do you systemize it so that you can do it daily? Um, (laughs) What I do is I have a list of people I follow on a daily basis. Like, these are my go-tos. I'm not saying I don't follow anyone else. No, but these are my go-tos. Like, I don't want to miss a single post from these people. But Mm -hmm. 
in that same list, what I've done is I've put in the times that they actually post. Ah. I, I know to a minute, Richard, Ash, whoever, Matt, they're going to post at 9 a.m. my time. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll log into LinkedIn. This is probably five minutes of my time. Everyone can do this. Like you can literally just, if you're just going to grab a coffee, you know, like, while you're doing the curry thing and bo boiling water and pouring it, you can have LinkedIn on the side for two, three, five minutes. So what I'll do is I'll just open up these three profiles. I'll see that they have fresh posts, like literally posted one minute ago. I'll read it, leave my comment, and I'm out of here. But my yeah. comments will be, again, really thoughtful, really strategic. And I'm out of there. If I have more time... I'll spend time on my feed. So now I've covered like three people that are my go-tos, but I'll also check my feed for any sort of good content. If I see something, I don't care if you have 100 followers. I don't care if I follow you. I don't care if we're connected or not. I will leave a comment. I will support. That's how I genuinely find good content based off of recommendations of all the stuff that I already interact with and the people I already follow. So I'll probably do this like three or four times a day it genuinely takes me five to 10 minutes. Yeah. So I'll go in at 9 a.m. I'll go, a lot of people post around one. A lot of people post around three. A lot of people, you know, like it's literally one, two, three. That's when a lot of people post in the afternoon. Yeah. I'll just go in for five or 10 minutes, stay there, leave my comments, and I'll go. Yeah. And I'll probably come back later in the night to see all the replies, to see everything. If people have reacted to my comments, I will go back and check my comments. Yeah, so it's yeah. not about the quantity of it. It's really about the quality of it. I will go back, and if there are people who have responded, left their replies, I'll try to react to their comments and you know further the conversation. So every single day, if you end up doing this, what you have is just constant attention, but also new conversations, new people, new followers, and it's just never-ending. But it's so simple to do. Like people think it genuinely takes a lot of time. It doesn't. You just have to know where to be and at what time. You know, like you got to figure it out for each creator. But once you get this list done, you only have to create it once and you're done. Oh, amazing. Amazing. I'm going to go and set up my sheet. So I have a thousand more questions for you, Jasmine, but I realize you're a very busy guy and we're at the end of our time. So thank you so, so much for your time today. Hugely appreciated really really inspired and i'm sure uh, those watching this will be really inspired too so how is it best for them to get in touch with you if they if they want to sp want to speak to you well my linkedin is probably the the, the most go-to place where you can reach me i'm currently accepting one-on-one -on -one consultations in my free time which is new Amazing. Uh, yeah because i'm fully booked with projects i don't accept any projects as far as copywriting and strategy goes but i decided to sacrifice some of my free time and accept one-on-ones and I do a lot of one-on-ones. As soon as people heard, as soon as they saw the little link on my profile, it's just always something But So yeah, my LinkedIn is probably the best place or my website, heyj, heyj.com, hey-j.com. So. Perfect. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll speak again in the future. Hope so. By the way, this was lovely. I wish we could stay more. I wish you, I wish you booked a, a longer time slot, Heather. <laughs> Well, I hope this is my first go. Maybe we'll do a nice longer one later on. <laughs> Let's make plans for it. This is just number yeah. one. Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> okay. Well, thank awesome. you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a, have a wonderful week. Thank you. You too. Thank you.